let me ask you all to, to reflect as, as, as we come to uh, the end here about uh, some of the most promising opportunities that you see in your areas. Now, it's different than the signs of hope, but just what are the next steps that you see yourself taking? And um, you know, what's on the horizon that you think will help pull together a uh, response to these challenges that we've been talking about here today? Now, Alexander, you've been pretty detailed about your, uh, your journalistic uh, odyssey here. Um, although I'm a little disappointed it's not going to be in a boat, but I guess so. <laughs> Actually, it's going to be um, on a 45-foot tour bus that we're using as our mobile workstation and editing suites. Oh, so that's a land yacht anyway. So it'll be, yeah, it'll be sort of yeah. our land calypso. There yeah, you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, I think I will close my remarks with what I think is the most important takeaway about water um, for people to remember, um, which is that these problems are solvable. And um, they're solvable at a lot of different levels. Um, almost a billion people don't have access to clean drinking water solvable problem, very solvable. We have everything we need to solve it. We just have to continue working at it and working at it better and faster, but we can solve this. What, what, what specifically should we do? Um, um, there is just the investment of time and money and infrastructure, um, but the technologies are very simple and we know how to do it. We just have to do it more and better. Um, Two and a half billion people don't have access to sanitation. Huge issue. One of the leading causes of death for children under five worldwide. Solvable issue. Um, dead zones that are being propagated around the world. Solvable. Uh, overfishing. Solvable. We just have to do it. But we can solve it. Um, and the faster we solve it, the better. Um, but for, you know, people often ask, okay, but those big issues are solvable, but what can I do at home? Mm -hmm. That's where I want to start. I want to start at home. And um, what people can do at home if they live on a farm is very different from what they can do at home if they live in New York City from a water perspective, purely water footprint perspective. Um, but what I do encourage everybody to do is to learn where your watershed is what your watershed is, where does your water come from, where does it go, and when it goes, what does it carry with it? Um, because in the process of learning about our watersheds that we live in, um, we learn about the threats, we learn about the solutions, we learn about the opportunities for engagement, and I think that it also gives us a greater understanding of this patch of planet that we each inhabit um, from a water standpoint. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I, I just want to follow up. Okay. Um, th there must be a little, little pet action that you might have in the back of your mind that you just kind of wish that we would all take, or those of us that have the capability could take to get rolling on this. Is there just, is there just one thing that you would suggest that, uh, that we do in, in response? Uh, to what's happening with water, that especially something that we could, excuse me, I better have another swallow here. <laughs> something that we could do in the very near term to make this concrete for us? <laughs> <It's the hint>. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, the what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, this is an interesting, you're going to get me on a different um, angle here, but Yes, I, we all know that water bottles, it's something that everybody's been talking about. Um, I would suggest, however, um, that, that water bottles aren't the only problem, yet we talk about them as if they were. And even if we abolish all water bottles tomorrow, we still have all the other bottles we carry liquid around in. And if you look at the footprint, the water footprint of a water bottle, it's about five to one. Um, if you look at the footprint of any bottle that has sugar water in it, of any kind, it's over 140 to 1. 
because of the water that goes into growing the sugar, the water that goes into all of that, the fruit, the soda. The, so, and, and when a bottle reaches the ocean or it reaches the landfill, it really doesn't matter what was in it. So while I think that there is a lot to be said for um, reducing our use of disposable water bottles, um, certainly the solutions are very easy. Um, get a SIG bottle and fill it up. That's pretty simple. Um, I think to address the larger challenge of plastics in our environment, um, we need to look at research and development on alternative materials. Um, increasingly, we're moving towards plant-based materials. That has its own set of challenges, but at least it's not plastic. We also need to invest in recycling. Um, and this is where corporations can really get involved. Coca-Cola has, um, for example, has pledged that they will recycle as many plastic bottles every year as they produce. It's a step in the right direction. They've built the biggest recycling plant there is in this country. Um, so I think we need to move towards recycling. We need to engage communities on reducing their waste and recycling their waste. And, uh, and look at more holistic perspective because we can get lost on the plastic water bottle issue um, and we can get lost on the plastic bag issue and think that if we just do that then then we'll solve all these other issues and and that's mistaken um, we do need to understand the holistic nature of these problems um, and um, and that's that's critical oh, as well. That's cool. All right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, love, I love having my guilt reduced with the water bottle. It's, 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 it's just a five to one just ratio five to of one. guilt. Okay. But when you drink Coke, it's 140. It's 140. So. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Gentlemen, which of you would like to step forward at this moment? Uh, He's looking to, at you, Mark. OK. <laughs> Uh, I would like to once again thank the Extension Program for making it possible for me to be here in many different dimensions, and I think it holds a lesson. Harvard is a very exclusive, very expensive place to go to school. There's not many places, and it costs a lot of money. But Extension gives a lot of people another door, a side door, a back door, into the Harvard experience. And I can say, as a biologist, having the opportunity to work with Richard Schultes and listen to Stephen Jay Gould and take classes with Ed Wilson is something that I'll spend the rest of my life being uh, uh, very annoying to other biologists who didn't have that opportunity. It's like being in Florence during the Renaissance, if you're in art history. And the lesson there is that sometimes you're told something can't be done, and it can be done. I went to a meeting of something called the Society for Conservation Photographers. And the topic of the meeting was, do wildlife documentaries make any difference whatsoever in today's world? And the answer was no, none whatsoever. Except, 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 if you take your documentary and sit down with the president of some third world country and say, you can live forever by making this area a national park and putting your kid's name on it, they'll do it. So if you take the easy answer, which is it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't do anything, it's a waste of time, you go away doing nothing. But sometimes the impossible happens because you're lucky or too dumb to take no for an answer, or tenacious, or what have you. And the lesson in that goes back to what Eric was saying about kids. Kids are the greatest environmentalists at all, of all. Why is that? Because they haven't had the idealism beaten out of them yet. <laughs> And when you think at how Harvard and Oxford and Cambridge and Yale and all these other institutions of high learning work, typically it's to focus you, focus you, focus you, focus you, focus you, so you spend 50 years studying one subspecies of lizard. And when I see Eric as a pioneering environmentalist working out of Harvard Medical School, that is the kind of out of the box thinking that makes the impossible happen. And so there are lessons in that, in not taking no for an answer. And I want to circle back to conclude where I started out. Two days ago, on the cover of the New York Times was an article that said, essentially, hallucinogens can cure incurable diseases. And it talked about this uh, psychologist who'd suffered from depression all of his life, and it was cured by taking uh, psilocybin from hallucinogenic mushrooms. Of course, what it forgot to point out was these are mushrooms from tropical Mexico discovered uh, through the research of the Botanical Museum of Harvard University, which later went on to yield Viscan, 
which is the first beta blocker, a heart drug. So once again, you get to the interconnectedness of all things of hallucinogenic mushrooms in 1968 and flower power and heart drugs and cures for incurable diseases. How cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> I assume that we're all here for the same reason, because we care. But you know what? Most people don't get it. So I am hoping that all of us will go forward from this meeting as missionaries who will missionize for Mother Earth and spirituality and new medicines and new agricultural products, biodegradable uh, uh, pesticides and clean water, because it's all the same story. Uh, as Alexander said, these problems are caused by people. They can be solved by people. Thank you once again. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God, going last. <laughs> <clears throat> so I will continue to spend the rest of my life trying to help people understand that our health is dependent on the health of the natural world. And I want to do this in several ways. One is that I want to help scientists and physicians communicate better with policymakers and the public. We're trained to speak to each other. We're not trained to speak in non-technical, non-jargon filled language, and that's a huge problem. So we've taught a course at Harvard Medical School. We're teaching a course again at Harvard School of Public Health to try to teach students who are becoming physicians and public health professionals about how to speak in everyday language about things that concern them scientifically. Uh, we've started this garden at Harvard. If Harvard ever gets its endowment up, it will become a two-acre farm on the Alston campus. We want students very involved in learning about sustainable and healthy food and what that means to things like climate change and use of water and use of pesticides. So we will continue to work on that. Our center is running uh, that program, which is very uh, exciting. We're working on uh, developing high school curriculum and maybe middle school curriculum and maybe grammar school curriculum about this relationship of human health to the living world because these are lessons that need to be learned at the various, very earliest ages. Uh, Mark's comments about forest, I want to make a plug for obviously the rainforests are our most wonderful resource on the planet. Uh, as well as the oceans, but let's not forget the forests in our own backyard. New England and New York State have 52 million acres of mixed 80 to 120 year old hardwood conifer forests that are slated for the chainsaw. Not all of them, but big chunks of them. Thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of acres. Clear cut. You know why? because there's a mistaken notion that this wood is carbon neutral to burn in wood chip biomass electricity plants to generate electricity. It is not carbon neutral. These forests take 20 to 30 years to regrow and begin to fix carbon the way they were before they were clear cut. This is a big issue, one that I'm going to be working on for a long time. I think if I told Anything that I would love to have you all do, I would love to have you grow fruit trees. Now, I know that's a big, big investment, but other than loving my life, my wife, I love my <laughs> life too. I do love my life. But other than loving my wife, Constance Jacobson, and my children, and all my close friends, I think growing fruit has been one of the single most wonderful experiences in my entire life. It does everything. You're outside working. You're trying to understand what's happening in nature that gives you fruit one year and not another year. You are watching these incredibly beautiful blossoms come out. And then, my God, you can eat this luscious fruit. There's nothing in the world like a ripe peach from your own tree. Believe me. So and grow your own food. If it's only in a container in your kitchen or on your windowsill or under a grow light, it's magical every time. And finally, I'd like to say, to quote my, quote Winston Churchill. This, I'll get to the quote from Winston Churchill, but life is sacred. It's taken three and a half billion years to evolve. Our species evolved 195,000 years ago. 
Homo sapiens struggled to survive over millennia. Life was unbelievably difficult, <coughs> and we have to continue. So I urge you, never, this is the quote from Winston Churchill, never, never, never give up in trying to protect the natural world. <clears throat> One last thing. Um, we will be leaving on expedition at the end of June. Um, everything I do, I do because I really want to share this with people. And I really want people to be able to join us and journey with us, even if it is um, through the internet. But um, we will be sharing every day of this uh, four month journey across North America with people. Um, and I really would love for all of you to check in with us. We're going to actually have community action days um, where we work with communities um, to clean up their beaches or support their local nonprofits. And we can have a party here at Harvard. That would be nice as we pass through. But um, alexandracousseau.org um, will also be hubbed out of nationalgeographic.com's freshwater portal. And it's a daily experience. And so please, um, early July, check in and join us, write to us, follow us, and, um, and we'd love to have you. So, Alexandra, Eric, Mark, Steve, I, I think I speak on behalf of all of us that we deeply, deeply appreciate this gift that you gave us, the generosity of your time and your insight. I mean, this is so gratifying, but it was frightening, it was inspiring, and I think we're just chatting here how it's, it's re-energized and gives us a new challenge to our missions and where we can all contribute. And uh, so we appreciate that very much and want to thank you for that.